Hmm. Imagine reversing the roles. Honestly, how could they convince you to allocate enough of your current paychecks for use after some uncertain date in the future. Have you tried this on them? Remember, they're spenders, not savers. They've acquired a taste for instant gratification. So I think it's safe to say that if your plan lacks excitement, it'll probably have only marginal success. I've been around for a long time. Look at my wrinkles over four decades as a financial insider. Did you get a load of all that extracurricular stuff in the red font? Okay, forget that. Stop reading and listen. Here's my point. All that serious study, those licenses, associations, and certifications, and all you're thinking about is that hot little roadster. Now you're thinking like a boomer. The serious stuff, it's just blah, blah, blah. What your mind wants to do is look for excitement. What can we find for today? This is the kind of simple distraction that paralyzes your boomer clients. Boring stuff just gets shuffled into some unreserved time slot that seldom happens. We're great procrastinators. Okay, to answer your curiosity, yes, it's a hair on fire event just driving that little beast to the grocery store. I bought it back in 1997 after years of lusting after it, and yes, it was worth it. As I see it, that kind of focus parallels what many boomers are beginning to cultivate for securing their comfort and security during their golden years. But the actual execution of the strategy will be more like crawling on a mile of broken glass. That is, until they can go shopping. Clearly, it's nothing like the precision of a NASA launch, and it defies logic. On November 4, 2014, the Demand Institute released their report with startling numbers about boomers planning to spend $1.9 trillion on homes in the next five years. Startling because of what these numbers represent. 77 million boomers, and 50% of them plan to age in place. That's no surprise to us. But 37% of them plan to move before they retire. And of those movers, nearly half say they're going to buy bigger, nicer homes. Now that's great news for the home builders and realtors, but you know the dirty little secret. 80% of boomers, 62 million of them, are at risk to run out of money before they die. Most of these buyers are a part of that 80%. Yet, most of the homes they're going to buy will need to be financed. This just so happens to support the AARP study that indicated 30% of boomers have admitted they intend to work until they drop. Let me set the table on this. AARP reports that 40% of boomers plan to work until they drop. But according to Barry Sachs, PhD and practicing tax attorney specializing in pension-related legal matters since 1973, and his brother Stephen Sachs, professor emeritus of economics at the University of Connecticut, even if you're among the group they describe as the mass affluent, with several hundred thousand in retirement savings, you're likely to encounter financial difficulties in retirement. They say mass affluent is a very misleading term because they're not massively affluent. Rather, there's a mass of them and they're almost affluent. They estimate that they'll have between 750000 and $2 million in net worth at retirement. These are the seniors who have almost enough to live comfortably. In other words, they're not out of the woods. But let's assume just for now that they're set. I admit I selected this slide for effect and maybe it's a bit cheesy. But the slaughterhouse analogy of boomers approaching retirement isn't much of a stretch for some. 
the nearer they get to retirement age, boomers' biggest fear transitions to running out of money before they die, which is why 40% of them admit that their golden year plan is to work till they drop. Obviously, this must be less of a plan and more of a reluctant fallback position in order to keep a roof over their heads until the end. Apparently, they don't realize even this strategy is a reckless gamble and we need to change their focus. They're going to need to approach retirement as seriously as soldiers approach mortal combat because the outcome can be equally severe. Having experienced war firsthand, I was sickened by the ridiculous lopsided rules of engagement dictated by faceless suits sitting out of harm's way halfway around the world. Back then, I wished I had the power to eliminate those stupid rules because so many lives, including my own, were at risk. Today, I think I can help you to help your senior clients eliminate serious threats to the retirement security that they're counting on for the rest of their lives. If AARP is right, over 30 million of us plan to work, drop, adios, but that leaves over 30 million more that haven't yet figured out what's going to happen. Maybe they're in denial. Perhaps they just haven't begun the process of analyzing their numbers after all. Boomers are procrastinators. But do you see the problem here? 30 million who have already thrown in the towel are only half of the number who are at risk to run out of money before they die. But here's where their plan falls short. As we age, our bodies aren't as resilient as they once were. It's when many accidents and emergencies find them. Working till they drop assumes that they'll keep their job. But just one medical emergency or even a simple job layoff, and the roof over their heads is in serious jeopardy. That is, if they don't find a solution to protect this from happening. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, 80% of boomers at risk. The more you hear it, the more it sinks in. These are horrible odds, wouldn't you say? I personally believe that seniors need to know the gruesome truth about their odds. The sooner the better. This is kind of tough love, and by the time they acknowledge these odds, they're not going to like you very much for sharing them. That is, until you reveal how they can beat the odds and retire securely on a shoestring budget. Granted, not all boomers will be able to beat the odds. But let's just assume that the ones who've been serious enough to enlist help from financial professionals can. Here's some gas on their fire. The Demand Institute confirmed that the majority of boomers want to age in place. That's nothing new for us, but the recent revelation that a whopping 37% of them plan to move before retiring, and almost half of the movers plan to buy nicer homes, totaling $1.9 trillion in the next five years, which equates to roughly 25% of the total projected home sales in America in each of those five years. So while you may not be able to keep them from their spending binge, there's still time to advise them how to do it in a manner that promotes a formidable defensive retirement strategy. After all, the top priority for most of us is to live safe and secure under the roof of our own home. This is where I can help you help them do it right. Here's a little detail that many boomers have no idea even exists. You and I know that others can forcibly take their home away and even big guns can't protect them, right? But there's a formidable protective retirement strategy that removes that threat even though it wasn't really designed for that purpose. In a shoestring budget retirement with limited resources, if you have any financial setback, it's likely you'll never recover. So a formidable defense is required. I keep a loaded gun in my home for protection. 
If I were awakened by an armed intruder trying to steal my valuables, I'd use it. Laws would support my action. But if someone's coming after my most prized possession, my home, even big guns will come up short. As seniors age and some of their faculties fade, they can become prey to so many financial pitches that put their viability at risk. This is a weapon to protect seniors from a wide variety of them and more. It helps them lock down having a roof over their heads until they die. When I disclose the weapon, I expect that you're going to balk because for years, negative articles about it appeared in a wide variety of even respected publications. I'm embarrassed to admit that for years I believed them, not because I did the research, I had no reason to. I assumed the writers did the research. Sadly, I can confirm that they didn't, or maybe they took a lazy path of piggybacking on others whose articles were published, assuming them to be accurate. Well, they're dead wrong. What is crystal clear is that many people, even financial professionals, have accepted erroneous information about the most flexible retirement weapon on the planet to the detriment of so many seniors whose golden years would be far more secure by using it. On the bright side, it works without making a mess or inflicting bodily harm. I hope I never need it, but I assure you, I will have one. This is going to be a mouthful. When you help a senior into the Hickam financing strategy for their retirement home, this isn't hyped to accommodate a few additional luxury features on their home. It's a giant leap towards protecting them from the future sequences that can end with the loss of money, the loss of their home, and the loss of their dignity. This isn't just some little trinket benefit to your client. It's a solution to something that keeps many of them awake at night, a preventive strategy that once completed when their home closes, they're secure. No alligators under the beds to worry about. The ones who don't lose sleep are the ones who have yet to figure this out. Comprehensive studies on the costs of homelessness and the scarcity of shelter solutions is an incredibly expensive problem that our society, locally and nationally, will be unable to finance. Today, the numbers are only a small fraction of what are projected during the next decade. Keeping your client out of that mix is huge. It levels the playing field to keep them in their home and off the streets. So you tell me, is that a big deal? Okay, just a little background. When you use a Hickam to protect your senior buyers, the long-term results will not include a scene like this. We know that the day someone becomes homeless is not just a bad day. It's not an insignificant date that they'll ever forget, like a birthday or an anniversary. Rather, it's the day that their treasures became trash and their lives became a little piece of a dire statistic. The older the victim, the more tragic the impact. This is what you're protecting your senior clients from. If an unplanned event hits, their whole family will feel it. Again, the time to insulate their estate from complete collapse is not after an accident or a medical episode that can start the sequence, but before any potential episode can rock it. I saw an ad on TV recently of a guy getting into his car when he noticed a note held by a wiper blade that read, you're going to have a heart attack today. I don't know how you'd treat this, but I'm quite certain I'd have to go back inside and change my underwear. But if it happened to you, would you drop everything and make a mad dash to the nearest emergency room? I mean, like, right freaking now? Do you see the problem? We're living longer and no one knows just how things will go. A recent study by the Employee Benefit Research Institute 
found that Medicare only covers about 62% of a retiree's health care costs. Okay, so put yourself in this predicament. Your spouse has a totally unexpected stroke or heart attack or accident. Doesn't matter the cause, but you find yourself in a huddle with emergency room doctors who tell you there's a chance that your spouse can be saved, but the decision window is quickly closing and you've got to approve what action they take. Time is of the essence. Would you, A, give a green light to whatever they suggest, so they can proceed without loss of any more critical time. B, begin negotiating with them on price, including a fixed cannot exceed amount. C, tell them you need a little more time to compare prices with other hospitals. Or D, give them a red light and tell them to turn off the buzzers because you hadn't planned for anything like this. Now, this may sound callous, but A is only prudent if you've already protected your estate. Yet, and you already know this, most people pick A. So, how much will retirees spend on health care? Hold on to your seats. The Center for Retirement Research at Boston College reports that out-of-pocket health care expenses for a couple at age 65 could range anywhere from $197,000 to $570,000 during their remaining lifetime. A Fidelity study says that a 65-year-old couple will need an additional $240,000 to cover out-of-pocket costs not covered by Medicare. According to a University of Michigan law professor, Americans age 55 and older account for over 20% of personal bankruptcies in the United States. Most are caused by medical emergencies and 75% of those filing were covered by private health insurance. Bankruptcy involves time, stress, records, attorneys, and, of course, more money. If you were prepared in advance, this would not be necessary. We're living longer and we're much more active at our age than earlier generations were. Sure. Some of this can be attributed to medical discoveries, paying closer attention to our diet intake and more exercise, but there are also so many more new and exciting things to do at our age that our parents' generation never even imagined. Are you as astounded as I am by the spiraling costs of medical procedures? Procedures that may work, or maybe they won't. Yet all of them end up as big numbers on a bill and they all want to be paid. Now I don't know which of those numbers will come true for whom, but I can tell you that's a lot of money any way you slice it. And When the bill comes, it won't be at a convenient time. If you can't pay the bill immediately, they're going to put you on a payment plan. And if you fall behind, the collection department will go after your house to get paid. Yet, a benchmark for retirees for years has been to own their homes free of debt. So how would homeless fit into your retirement plan? A September 2014 report from Zillow says that it costs more to rent than to buy in every major United States city. In my neck of the woods, Phoenix, they say the average home buyer would spend less than 18% of their income to own a median priced home versus almost 27% to rent it. There are many fresh studies projecting rampant growth in rents down the road, which is why in the book, I suggest that renting isn't even a good plan B if it's at all possible for you to own your retirement home. This is where it gets tough. 
I have an athletic cousin named Jim who's only a year older than me. A few months ago, results from a routine medical checkup revealed that Jim's body is riddled with cancer. Now all of his time is preoccupied with hospital visits, procedures, and fatigue. I can tell you this, to delay implementation of a financial strategy to protect their nest egg can be the difference between having a roof over their heads or losing their home. Rolling the dice on security can leave them out in the cold. This is protection from outside the conventional boundaries. When you're in serious financial danger, you won't be concerned about how you protected yourself, just how well it worked. My home is my territory. Like a lion, I'll defend my territory. Everyone should. I'll show you how to keep that roof over their heads when the law would have allowed others to take it from them. This covers two top retirement objectives, housing and nest egg, and, well, of course, happiness as well. My home is a space where I'm in relative control and I feel relatively safe. Why else, according to the studies, would retirees on a fixed income allocate the lion's share of their carefully trimmed budget to housing? Sure. You might score a bed in a shelter or just sleep under a bridge, but my personal preference is a dry bed with clean sheets. So many people put off important choices like downsizing, relocating, and lifestyle options longer than they should, when any move will be harder because of age and, and choices will be narrower because of price elasticity, financing qualification, and such. Or, after an unplanned emergency, when it's already too late. Make them quit resisting that little voice in their heads. Now is the time to start making their list of wants, needs, and desires for housing. Getting it done early allows more choice options for the rest of their lives. We're planning retirement on a shoestring budget. There have been quite a number of studies, several in 2014, on the financial impact of housing expense to seniors' household budget bottom line. Each with differing cross-section details, most with similar findings. The biggest monthly budgetary expense for most seniors is housing. Remember that horrific note on the windshield? What good are any warnings if they do nothing to remedy the problem? They can't protect themselves after the fact. Once they've completed three steps, they're done. After they finish the three steps, tell them they're welcome to revert back to being the champion procrastinator for every other thing in life that they're trying to avoid because they'll already have their secure spot under the roof that can protect them for the rest of their lives. The three steps. Number one, they need to commit to a sense of urgency. Number two, they need to make their home selections. And number three, they need to make their retirement home look horrible to a debt collector. They're going to be thinking, really? This is the breakthrough that's supposed to let me retire? And I'm thinking, yep. This may be just the kick in the pants they need to escape the rat race. So let's revisit reality. They'd rather not work until they drop. They suspect they don't have sufficient funds in their nest egg to retire. They want financial protection for what they do have. They want choices not insurmountable problems. This isn't some genie in the bottle granting three wishes. This is a rat race escape route. Finding a solution for a top item on their retirement needs list at a bargain is great. Finding this one that covers additional whistles and bells that also appear high on the list, plus protection that was probably not even on their list, will be like 
a little slice of heaven. Even when they downsize, consider that qualifying for traditional financing involves much stricter lending guidelines than they may have grown accustomed to, including income verification, credit scores, specific liquidity reserves, just to get approved. Loss of their job can throw their qualification out the window, and they may be unable to continue making the big monthly payments. So, how would losing their home support an orderly transition into retirement? Retirement needs to be all about having choices, not insurmountable surprises. Face it, they're screwed if they don't have enough money to cover their house payment. This strategy doesn't require a house payment. Understand, even a little joy ride to the hospital like the needless one I took last year can be expensive. Mine was booked by my hysterical wife and ended up needlessly costing thousands of dollars for the privilege of a six-mile ride in a vehicle with a blaring siren. I knew I was okay and I told the ambulance crew my story when they arrived. They suggested I might as well just go to the hospital for a checkup, better safe than sorry. Well, my wife was freaked out. She liked their pitch and insisted that I go. She followed in her car and was at the admittance counter almost as soon as they rolled me in. If I'd followed the not totally unbiased suggestions of the hospital emergency room staff, I'd have been admitted on the spot and then promptly whisked away for countless exams and procedures that they said needed to be done. They said a specialist had been called and was rushing to the hospital to examine me. So I sat in the emergency room on a wheeled cart wearing a backless gown for five hours, listening to creative excuses for the physician's delay, during which time I continually refused to be admitted until a physician found suitable reason for me to do so. But no doctor appeared. Finally, I got dressed and told them that if I really had urgent need of a physician, one would have found me by now, or perhaps I'd already be dead. And I left. The bill totaled several thousand dollars. The coded pages make, made it appear that something was actually done, but nothing aside from the ride happened. Yeah, call me lucky. Uh, that bill could have skyrocketed had I followed their suggestions. The point is, we paid the bill, even though I thought they should have at least offered me a cigarette after the way I was apparently screwed. Had I already been judgment-proof back then, I certainly would have negotiated the bill down to perhaps the price of the ride. If I'd already downsized and financed my retirement home with a Hickam, I'd have been protected financially. Lesson learned. What? Oh, how, you ask? First, I'm not suggesting that they should stiff a collector for goods or services rendered because they shouldn't. All I'm saying is that with so much on the line, collectors will be challenged to go after their home to extract payments. This gives them more options, choices, and control in difficult situations. I'm also suggesting that it would be irresponsible of them not to employ this sort of defensive strategy in protecting their personal security. When they're actively trying to stretch their money, what sense would it make to allow anyone to scoop all of the money from their bank accounts and take away their home? In order to set their budget retirement up for lifelong security, all of their nest egg assets should be considered deployable to initiate their defense. The takeaway from that wasted Thursday morning is it could have been much worse. I might have had a real medical problem and the emergency room might have injected tens of thousands of dollars onto the bill covering several pages that only a healthcare code specialist might be able to decipher and I'd have had to pay them. Or 
They could have gone after my home to get the money. Or worse yet, we could have been retired, owning our retirement home free and clear, and making ends meet on a modest fixed income budget, where such an event would eat months, if not years, off of our nest egg. And if we were unable to pay the bill on their terms, they would have started the process to go after our home for satisfaction of the bill. This is the snowball effect that they never want to experience. A well-off friend and client of mine had a siren ride of his own a few years ago. His ended up with a heart procedure, and the bill was over $100,000. He was covered by an excellent health policy, but his insurance company limited their payment to about $17,000. That's it. George had previously made himself judgment-proof. When the dust settled, he told the collectors to accept the insurance offer or leave it, and he let them know they'd be getting nothing more from him. They took it, and he's done with them. At a minimum, his nest egg could have taken a hit of $83,000, but didn't. Even if you have excellent insurance coverage, you're still at risk. Medical procedures can be very expensive. Even name brand high price policies have lots of small print, which is not a paper saving strategy. This is where they hide all of the tricky language. Have you ever read every page of a thick policy, both big and small print? I have out of necessity. That was part of my job when I was self-employed. There are lots of rules and numbers in group policies. Some of them are limits, some deductibles, some are clauses that apply to in-system procedures by select physician. There can be upcharges for anything outside the networks and so on. The point is, even when you're wrapped in the best policy money can buy, covering everything you can possibly imagine, you can still get the surprise of a lifetime. Trust me when I tell you that big expensive surprises are no fun when they're introduced by a letter from a law firm or anyone else that's coming after whatever you have to satisfy whatever they say you may owe. If any surprise in retirement does not call for party hats and cocktails, be afraid or be protected in advance. We live in a litigious society. Defending yourself from even small, unsubstantiated nuisance issues can be expensive. Sitting unprotected in a courtroom is not on my bucket list. Protection from this should be on yours. Carrying insurance or having Medicare and its supplements will not be enough there is ever-increasing importance to evaluating risk to your household if you encounter uncovered medical or other expenses. A short stay in in a hospital can cost tens of thousands of dollars. A major illness or injury could last weeks, even a month or more. So thank goodness you're insured, right? Trust me on this, I've done the research, and the percentage of rejected claims, even with top name brand insurers, can exceed 30%. That's 30% of claims rejected, not 30% of the entries on a bill. That's a big difference. A rejected claim on a policy that already cost big bucks to eliminate this sort of surprise triggers time, and stress, and attorneys, and even more money. And at the end of the day, it may be futile. There are trained professionals whose responsibility is focused on making sure that nothing care-related was forgotten. You've heard the word redundant in arguments about bills, right? There may be thousands of dollars of needless, better safe than sorry tests, that are going to show up on their big bill that they agreed to let them do when they gave them the green light. Come on, 
What did they think the agreement in that emergency room huddle with the doctor was all about? It's about the money they expect them to spend. They already know the desired outcome. If you recall, their answer was A, green light, wasn't it? They've got good insurance, don't they? That was the security blanket that allowed them to give the green light in the first place, wasn't it? What will they do if their insurance claim is rejected? I mean, besides spending countless stress-filled hours on the phone with the doctors and the insurance company and the hospital billing department and their bank, they're not going to sleep very well. Where's the happy in that? Think about this. In battle, not once did I ever see a medic discuss money before trying to save a downed GI's life. Now, excuse me for dragging this out, but I can't say this in words too harsh, too loud, or too many times. Protect them, protect their home, and protect their retirement. Let's up the ante. Let's say they don't have ready cash to pay the bigger than anticipated bill. Let's also say they own their home, their retirement home, free and clear. Oh boy, that's going to look like a big wiggly worm on a hook to the hungry fish in the collection department. In 2007, I stumbled upon something while reading small print on some legal documents, and I began connecting dots that pointed to a powerful strategy. What I found may be the simplest financial protection device on the planet, but it isn't marketed as one. I call it my treasure map, and I'll share it so your clients can retire safe and secure beyond their current imaginary limits. Statistics say that most boomers are not prepared for retirement, and the math we do in our secret thoughts, we think they may be right. But again, we're the baby boomers. As we move through life, we disrupt status quo. Retirement will be no different. Some of us have saved more than others. Many of us who don't believe there's any chance for retirement will learn they may be able to retire on a shoestring budget that also includes counterintuitive shell of protection that unplanned circumstances will not crush. Hey, this isn't the way we expected to enter our golden years, but we never expected to get slammed by the housing crash of 2008, either. Having a hickam on their home before an unplanned circumstance can be a game changer. It's like calamity insurance. Even though most people don't go to the extra step of meeting with attorneys and planners, insurers, and all the rest of the financial community for their opinions before putting the hickam in place, this piece of the puzzle has me giddy with excitement because this huge benefit comes free with the hickam that they selected for other financial reasons altogether. This incredibly valuable protection device can be the difference between recurring cold sweat nightmares or sleeping well, stressing about job loss or retiring on a shoestring, a roof over their heads for the rest of their lives, or no roof at all. But I haven't even mentioned why most people elect to use perhaps the most flexible financial retirement tool on the planet. They want more spending money. Their house is likely their largest store of wealth. If they need more income, it's the logical place to look. A hickam isn't risky or tricky or scary. It's like any other mortgage. They retain the title of their home. They can sell it whenever they wish, and it can still be handled down to their heirs. The big difference is that they will not be required to make mortgage payments ever again. They can if they want to, and, well, some people just do. But most trusted advisors would probably suggest otherwise. Although there are countless ways to structure a HECM, 
The four basic strategies are easiest to differentiate. For example, number one, when you own the home outright, free and clear, create tenure income, receive a monthly check much like an annuity for as long as either you or your spouse lives in that home. Number two, set up a line of credit. Unlike traditional credit lines that were frozen or canceled when we needed the money for emergencies during the recession, the Hickam line of credit cannot be canceled or frozen, period. Number three, if you have a small mortgage on your home, pay it off. The most popular reason for borrowers to get a Hickam is that they want to eliminate their current mortgage payments and use that money that would have been sent to their mortgage lender for other lifestyle choices. This is a no-brainer. If you still have a mortgage payment, it's probably your biggest monthly payment. Getting rid of it can allow you to use that money for other lifestyle stuff. Number four, use it to purchase your retirement home. Having a roof over your heads for the rest of your lives is at the top of your list for a safe and secure retirement, isn't it? earlier, I suggested that I'm going to be downsizing my home for retirement, but I was surprised to read the October 2014 report from the Demand Institute that said most baby boomers plan to age in place, but 37% of them have near-term plans to buy their retirement home, and 47% of those that are looking to move are expecting to buy nicer homes with more space. According to the report, boomers will spend $1.9 trillion on home purchases in the next five years. Using a Hickam to purchase a retirement home of any size can stretch the number of whistles and bells and other luxury features that can be included in that home. It also facilitates buying in better neighborhoods that would have been out of reach without this no mortgage payment financing. And don't forget, the Hickam will protect the roof over your head for the rest of your lives. So a non-recourse loan is simply a loan that the lender can't come after the borrower or anybody else for any reason down the road. The end. That's it. So upon the death of the borrower or a surviving spouse, title transfers to the heirs, just like any other mortgage property. Regardless of how much interest compounds over the life of the loan, the payoff is going to be capped at 95% of the home's value at that time. So imagine if traditional mortgages were like that during the crash, nobody would have been upside down on their mortgage. All other benefits pale in comparison to the financial protection a Hickam provides to you and your spouse. To keep that roof over your heads for the rest of your lives, not to mention no mortgage payments. I got my Boomer membership card when I arrived in a pink nine pound package on December 1st, 1947 at 4.15 in the morning in Detroit, Michigan. I just completed a rather counterintuitive book on the topic to simplify issues that many seniors find confusing. The title is What Every Senior Ought to Know About Retiring how to retire safe and secure on an underfunded nest egg. This book uses plain talk about a simple event that often sounds complicated. I'm publishing this to give seniors who have accumulated fewer assets than traditionally believed necessary to retire a fresh perspective to an elusive solution. Hey, how does this sound? Very short book, relatively large print. Read it front to back in an evening. In the spirit of full disclosure, I want you to know that I have a personal vested interest in boomer retirement strategies. I have seven siblings, all boomers, 
and all but a couple are in the at-risk category. Sure, the research that spawned the book began after my dad died, and I was left to find a way to protect my mom's wish to remain in her home as long as possible, even if for only a year. As this book hits the press, that was over seven years ago. Mom will be 93 this year and is still in her home safe and secure. I realized that the troubling issues I found for seniors back in 2007 are alive and well and even more dire in 2015, and they're expanding far faster than I ever imagined possible. Respected studies project that tens of millions of us will be chewed up and spit out on the streets in our golden years. I want to help you help your clients save time, money, and the roof over their heads. So this is the day that you received the note on the windshield. How are you going to handle it? Remember, I implored you to treat it as a priority. Accordingly, if you need more detail about this incredibly flexible defensive strategy, you will be my priority. You can contact me at bkennedy at minorkennedy.com. Thank you.